Welcome to our Langtang Valley Trekking Guide. In this film, we are going to tell you everything you need to know about this beautiful trek in Nepal, including all the practical stuff like the best seasons trek, what the accommodation and the food is like, how much stuff costs, how to get there, what permits you need, all that kind of stuff. Plus, we'll run through what each day on the trek is like with some stats and a trail overview. This very much goes hand in hand with our Langtang Valley Trekking films. They are silent hiking in style, so no talking, just good visuals, ambient sound. So if you're looking for a more relaxing visual guide to the Langtang Valley Trek, then go and check them out if you haven't seen them already. We have a short version, which pretty much focuses purely on the trail itself, and then a full length version, which has a lot more footage from guest houses and just shows you a bit more about the kind of day to day experience on the trail. So you can find them over on our channel and they are linked in the description down below as well. If you're new to our channel, welcome. We are Kim and Del Hogg and we share travel films here on YouTube. We also have an accompanying blog, Going the Whole Hog, where we share written guides, itineraries and resources about hikes and outdoor adventures from all over the world. So if you are looking for even more details about the Langtang Valley Trek, do head over to our website. We have a full written guide and also the route description. And we also have various guides for other treks in Nepal. We trekked in the Langtang Valley in late March 2023. It was part of a longer trip to Nepal where we also went to Gosankunda and trekked the Everest Three Passes route. This was actually our fourth time in the country. We've done various treks before in the Manaslu, Annapurna and Upper Mustang regions. We partnered with a local trekking agency called Himalayan Masters for this trek and we had a really good experience organising everything with the owner Sandeep beforehand and also during the trek with our guide Govinda. So if you're looking for a guide or you want to organise a full trekking package for Nepal, we would definitely recommend getting in touch with Himalayan Masters and you will get 5% off the cost of your trip if you mention our referral code COG5, which is a nice wee discount for you. So let's get into this and tell you all about the Langtang trek. The start and the end point of the Langtang Valley Trek is a small town called Shabru Besi. It's about 115 kilometres north of Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, and you can get there by private jeep or public bus. It takes about five and a half to nine hours to get there, and that very much depends on your mode of transport and the condition of the roads at the time. And then the Langtang Valley extends east from Shabru Besi and is dotted with small villages and tea house settlements all the way up the valley as far as a place called Kyanjin Gompa, which sits at around 3,900 metres. And this is the turnaround point of a Langtang trek. So you basically trek up the valley to the end point and then you head back down the valley again. The Langtang trek uh, is not in a restricted area, so you don't need any special or expensive permits. You just need to pay the Langtang National Park entrance fee, which is 3,000 rupees or about 23 US dollars. <laughs> Most people take around six to eight days to hike this route, plus you need to allow a day at the start and end of your trek to get to and from Kathmandu. So in total, you need eight to 10 days to do the Langtang Valley trek. The best time of year to trek in the Langtang Valley is either spring or autumn. So that would be mid-March to April or October into mid-November. It's best to avoid the monsoon months of June, July and August. It's too wet, it's too cloudy, you won't get any views, there'll be leeches, it's not a nice time to hike and also the winter months of January and February as it's just far too cold, it can be far too snowy and a lot of the guest houses are closed during that period. If you don't mind a bit of cold, uh, the kind of shoulder seasons of early March or late November and December can be a good time to trek because it's much quieter on the trail and also in December in particular you can have very clear skies and uh, sunny days. Generally speaking though, spring and autumn, that's the time to go. The trek itself is of moderate difficulty and we think the route is fantastic for showcasing a variety of landscapes and scenery. In the lower sections you'll trek through beautiful forest with a chance to see langur monkeys and in the upper sections of the valley you'll be surrounded by big snowy mountains towering over you and it's really very spectacular. The highest altitude that you'll sleep at on the Langtang Valley Trek is at Kyanjin Gompa, which is about 3,900 metres. But you'll have the chance to do a couple of day hikes from here up to Kyanjin Ri and to Chargo Ri, which will get you up to almost 5,000 metres, which is really very high. And we think it's fantastic that you've got this opportunity to get to such high altitudes, but without it being a, an integral part of your trek itinerary. For example, if you were trekking Manaslu circuit route or the Annapurna circuit route, 
you need to get over the high passes in order to get from A to B and to progress with your itinerary. But in the Langtang Valley, you don't really have that same kind of pressure on you. You can just on the day, see how you're feeling acclimatization wise, head off on the day hikes. If you're feeling good, that's great. You can get all the way up to the top. You'll have these spectacular views and then you're going to head back down and sleep at lower altitude. If you're not feeling so good, it's no problem really. Just do what you can. If you want to head back down without getting to the top, it doesn't matter. You're not impacting your overall trek itinerary. You don't have to make huge changes. You can just head back down the valley as planned. Yeah, it really is one of the big benefits of the Langtang Valley Trek. You get to trek up and down the valley, which itself is a great experience, but you also have the opportunity to go to a higher altitude with these day hikes and get the wonderful mountain uh, views, but no pressure. Yeah, this opportunity to trek up to about 5,000 metres while sleeping lower down at 3,900 metres means that the Langtang Valley Trek is also a really good acclimatisation hike if you're thinking about doing another trek afterwards, such as Manaslu or Annapurna Circuit or Everest Base Camp or Everest Three Passes Trek, which is exactly what we did. Yeah, so we were in a really good position acclimatisation wise when we started the Everest Three Passes Trek because we'd just been at high altitude in the Langtang Valley and our bodies were already accustomed to the lower levels of oxygen in the air. Yeah, so if you are planning to or you're thinking about maybe doing more than one trek in Nepal, definitely consider the Langtang Valley Trek as the first one that you do, as it works well for an acclimatisation hike and it's a bit of a, a good warm-up trek as well. And if you'd like to add another trek on to this one, two options are the Gosan Kundra Trek, uh, which we joined after the Langtang Valley, and the Tamang Heritage Trail. For something a bit more challenging, you can climb Yala Peak on a two-day, one-night camping expedition from Kianjin Gomba. Our Gosen Kunda films and guides will be coming up on the channel next, so if you're interested in seeing them, do subscribe and turn on the notification bell so that you're updated whenever we release them. There are guest houses or tea houses as they're often called all along the trek, so there's no need to camp. Uh, you can get a guest house every night and you can stay in a private room and sometimes even have a private attached bathroom. Some guest houses are quite basic, such as the older ones at Lama Hotel, which is a collection of guest houses, not just one hotel, by the way. Um, but generally speaking, the standard of accommodation in the Langtang Valley is pretty good. Um, many of the guest houses have been built since the earthquake in 2015, which hit this region particularly hard. There is always a dining room at the guest house where you'll eat your meals and you have a chance to chat with other trekkers, guides and the guest house owners themselves usually. And um, the only room that will be heated is the dining room. So there's a stove in there. There is going to be no heating in your bedroom or in the bathrooms. Toilets are sometimes sit down style, sometimes squat style, which you flush by scooping water out of a bucket. You can get a hot shower most days on the trek, but it's not always possible. And even when it is, sometimes the setup is very basic or it's too cold for you to even bother. Personally, we showered at four out of six of the guest houses that we stayed at, and all of those was when we had a private attached bathroom. Some villages along the Langtang Trek have electricity from a hydropower station, otherwise guest houses use solar power. Generally speaking, you'll be able to charge your devices like phones or camera batteries every day, but you may have to pay 300 rupees or so to charge, it's not always free. Wi-Fi isn't really available at most places along the trek, but you can get a data connection with a Nepal Telecom SIM card during much of the trek, but it isn't guaranteed every day and a signal can depend on the weather as well. In terms of food on the trek, you always eat at your guest house and you can expect the menu to be pretty similar everywhere you stay. Breakfast options are usually porridge, eggs, pancakes, chapati or Tibetan bread, with toppings like honey, jam, peanut butter, chocolate sauce, apples or yak cheese. Lunch and dinner options include Nepali classics like dalbat, which is basically a big plate of rice, dal, which is a kind of lentil soup, a veggie curry, papad or poppadom as we would call it, pickle and sometimes greens like spinach depending on whether it's available or not. And one of the best things about this dish is that you get free refills, unlimited free refills, on everything apart from the papads, which actually is my favourite bit, so that's always a little bit disappointing for me. But yeah, dalba is uh, a great meal to have. It, you will never go hungry because you can get all of the, the refills. It's very nutritious and filling, and yeah, as they say, dalba power. 
24 hours. Mm -hmm. Momos, which are a kind of steamed or fried dumpling, and various kinds of noodle soups are also on offer. And then a whole load of non Nepali dishes like pasta, fried rice, instant ramen, pizza, which tastes nothing like normal pizza, by the way. It's like mountain <laughs> pizza, it's basically just ketchup. Ingredients more or less revolve around eggs, yak cheese, potatoes, carrots, cabbage, onion, garlic, and tin tuna. So everything you order is just some variation of those ingredients. You can also get hot drinks like tea, instant coffee and hot chocolate. And you can buy soft drinks like Coke and Fanta too. A beer and rum are also available. Although drinking alcohol at altitude makes acclimatization more difficult. It's also a little bit more expensive. It's quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> So for drinking water, the best option is to take a refillable water bottle and some sort of water purification method, whether that's tablets or we use a steady pen, which sterilizes the water via a UV filter. So this is uh, not only good for the environment, it is good for your pocket, seeing as a bottle of water is going to set you back around $2.50 um, a bottle and you need to be drinking lots of water at altitude to help you acclimatize and also when you're trekking, you're going to be thirsty, you need to stay hydrated. So. Make sure you take a water bottle with you, maybe even a water bladder, which is what we use, and you have some sort of water purification method. The question of whether you need a guide to trek in the Langtang Valley is a bit of an ambiguous one. For many years, you only needed a guide to trek in Nepal if you were in a restricted area, such as the Manaslu Circuit or Upper Mustang, and the Langtang Valley is not a restricted area. However, in March 2023, the government announced that as of the 1st of April 2023, the rules would be changing and every foreign trekker would be required to hire a registered guide to trek in Nepal. Announcing such a significant change of policy with just three weeks notice at the very start of the spring trekking season caused confusion for trekkers and people working in the trekking industry alike, along with a lot of criticism of the policy itself and its implementation. So if you adhere to the new rules, the answer is yes, you do need to trek with a registered guide. However, from our own experience, trekking in Nepal in both March and April, i.e. pre and post mandatory guide rules, we found that people were still trekking independently without guides in April and that officials at permit offices and checkpoints weren't enforcing the rule. Of course, the situation could change at any time, so if you do want to trek in the Langtang Valley independently, it's best to get up-to-date information from trekkers on the trail at the time via Facebook groups or online forums. And it might be that the rule starts to be enforced more strictly over time, or it could be that the whole thing is just forgotten about and sort of disappears. With that said, we did trek with a guide which was always the plan in our case as we were partnering with Himalayan Masters and there are plenty of reasons to hire a guide rather than trekking independently, even if it's not mandatory. A guide will sort out all of the logistics both before and during your trek, such as transport, accommodation, settling up your guest house food and room bill and so on. They will also have great knowledge of the local area and be able to share valuable insights into local customs, culture and language. They will of course know the trail very well too and they'll be able to recommend good places to stay and eat and call ahead and book rooms for you during busier periods as well. On this trek we had a fantastic experience with our guide Govinda Rai who's one of the number of experienced and knowledgeable guides who work for Himalayan Masters. We ended up trekking together for more than a month in total and we really appreciate his advice and suggestions. We felt he always organised accommodation that was among the best available and just on a personal level, we really enjoyed his company as well. If you want to trek with a guide, the easiest way to do this is organise it through a trekking agency. You can usually arrange just a guide with the option of paying for your accommodation and meals yourself during your trek. But it's also very common just to book an inclusive package where you pay one upfront price and this covers the cost of your guide, all your transport, national park entrance fee, accommodation and three meals a day. We've trekked with guides in both scenarios in the past and it's definitely a more straightforward experience during your trek if you're just opting for a all-inclusive package. Logistically it's also easier as well. We should also say that you can hire a porter too who will carry your main bag meaning that you can just carry a day pack during the trek. Porters can also be organised via a trekking agency and it's very common for people to trek with both a guide and a porter. 
We carried our own bags on the Langtang trek, but we did decide to hire a porter for our Everest Three Passes trek. And we also trekked with a porter on our very first Nepal trek, way back in 2010 when we did the Annapurna Base Camp route. That was long before this YouTube channel or our blog, so you won't find any films and guides about that, but we will be making a few films and guides about our Everest Three Passes trek. So again, if you're interested, subscribe to the channel, turn on your notifications so that you're updated when they are released. We've organised treks with three different trekking agencies over the last decade or so, and our experience with Himalayan Masters has without doubt been the best of those three. So we are happy to recommend them if you're looking for a trekking agency to book your long time trek with. And as we said earlier, if you mention our referral code HOG5, H-O-G-T-5, when you get in touch with them, you'll get 5% off the cost of your trip. Uh, their contact details are somewhere on the screen here and they're down in the description below as well. The cost of trekking in the Langtang Valley very much depends on how you plan to do it. So whether independently, assuming that that is still an option at the time you come to trek, or whether you're with a guide and perhaps with a porter too. So if you're trekking independently, staying in the cheapest possible accommodation, eating three standard meals a day with no extra snacks, and travelling via public bus to and from Shaya you could budget about $24 per day. At the other end of the scale, if you're trekking with a guide, staying in nicer accommodation in rooms with private bathrooms and travelling via a private jeep to and from the trailhead, you can expect an inclusive package to average at around $100 per day. We've broken down various costs in our long time trekking guide over on the blog, so you can study that if you're looking for more specific budget advice. Packing for the Langtang Valley Trek is pretty similar to other Nepal treks or pretty much multi-day treks anywhere really. You'll need uh, layers, so base layers, a fleece, an insulating layer and waterproofs. And you'll need uh, hiking boots or shoes that are already broken in. And we'd also suggest some micro spikes in case there is snow up on Chargori. You'll also need a change of clothes for when you arrive at your guest house for the evening, including thermal base layers. Bedding is provided at every guest house, however blankets and sheets aren't necessarily freshly laundered after every guest. So for cleanliness, and also to guarantee you stay warm, it's best to take your own sleeping bag. We also recommend packing other things like trekking poles, a head torch, a water bottle, a first aid kit, plus essentials like your passport and your travel insurance details. It's just a very quick overview, but we have a full packing guide on our blog, which comes with a handy downloadable packing list and lots of advice about gear choices and tips for the trail. So check that out for a complete gear rundown. The link is in the description and any excess gear that you have, you can just leave in Kathmandu at your hotel or your trekking agency if they have an office. <laughs> As we mentioned before, the Langtang Valley trek takes between six and eight days. Our own itinerary was an eight day itinerary and we did make a few changes um, to the kind of standard route and also the kind of overnight stops uh, to suit us. Uh, and there were a few reasons for that. So the first change we made was to the route itself. The standard route or itinerary that most people follow uh, sticks to the Langtang Kola or, or river and just follows that all the way up the valley as far as uh, counting Gopa and on the first day you go to Lama Hotel is generally the main route but there is an alternative route to Lama Hotel and that involves climbing quite steeply out from uh, Shabru Bessi and going via a village called Sherpagon um, and we wanted to go this way so that we could um, experience a different route, see some different views and really take in more of the region um, than just going up and down the same way. And the views from Sherpagon are amazing, actually. It's, it's much, uh, much nicer than just going uh, to Lama Hotel, which is kind of stuck in a, a narrow valley. So it was definitely worth it. And we were glad that we made that change. So our day one itinerary went from Shabrubesi to Sherpagon, and then we carried on to Lama Hotel the next morning instead of the standard route, which we go straight to Lama Hotel. That was the first change that we made. The second thing that we uh, were very conscious of when looking at the altitudes involved and where we would be overnighting was that the standard itinerary tends to suggest going from Lama Hotel, which is at about 2,500 metres, 
all the way to Langtang on day two, which is at about 3,500 metres. So that's a 1,000 metre jump in elevation. And then on the following day, going up to Kianjin Gompa at 3,900 metres. Now, I know from past experience hiking at altitude in Nepal and in other countries that I'm pretty slow to acclimatise and I will suffer uh, symptoms of altitude sickness if I do not ascend slowly. So personally, I felt it was better to uh, go from Lama Hotel kind of altitude at two and a half thousand metres to 3000 metres or thereabout, which is more in line with sort of official guidance from, uh, you know, um, doctors and people who know about these kind of yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, the general, the general advice, the medical advice is once you get above 2500 metres, that you should ascend no more than three to 500 metres each day to then sleep. And yeah. every 1000 metres that you go up, you should then have a rest or an acclimatisation day before you then ascend again. So the kind of standard uh, pace of the itinerary in the Langtang Valley to go from 2500 to 3500 and then up again the next day and then to go up again even more to do like the day hikes and, and so on and so forth can actually be quite problematic if you are prone to uh, symptoms of altitude sickness. Or if you don't know if you're prone to it, it puts you at a greater risk of experiencing symptoms of altitude sickness. So we felt like that wasn't really sensible for us and that a better option was to sleep overnight at another place in between Lama Hotel and Langtang. So looking at the altitude, Goda Tabela is around 3000 meters, but um, after, after talking to our guide Govinda, he suggested carrying on to Tangshat, uh, which is at about 3200 meters because the accommodation options there are a bit better. And having now done the route, he was definitely right. It, it was a better option. So that was uh, another change that we made in terms of overnighting there instead of going all the way to Langtang. The third change that we made was uh, to spend three nights in Kianjin Gompa instead of two nights, which is more common uh, uh, when you look at kind of standard itineraries. So again, this was partly to do with altitude and just making sure that we were giving ourselves plenty of time to acclimatize, but also you have those opportunities to do the two day hikes from Kianjin Gompa up to Kianjin Ri and then up to Chargo Ri. And um, sort of standard itinerary involves getting into Kianjin Gompa, maybe going up to the viewpoint at Kianjin Ri that afternoon um, or the following morning and then leaving again. It doesn't really give you time to go to both viewpoints and to really enjoy them and have a restful experience and soak up that kind of amazing scenery that you find around Kianjin Gompa. So we definitely knew we wanted to spend three nights there, which gave us a full day uh, to hike to both viewpoints and also have the afternoon when we first arrived to just wander around the, the village and uh, relax and again help our bodies to acclimatise. So that meant uh, basically an extra two nights on top of the standard itinerary with the night at Tangshap and uh, the extra night at Kianjin Gompa. And then an additional change was the actual route on day one. So we will tell you more about sort of each individual day and our own experience on the trail, uh, sort of going into a bit more detail um, with maps and things just now. So the first day for us uh, involved getting to the trailhead itself in Shabrabesi. Uh, we took a private jeep from Kathmandu, which was organised uh, for us by Himalayan Masters. It took about five and a half hours to get there, including a lunch break, um, going through a variety of towns, villages, valleys. Uh, the road was in a bit of a bad condition at a few points, a bit, a bit muddy and a bit boggy. Uh, we went through the National Park entrance where we had to get out, show our passports, have our bags checked. Um, they're very particular about checking for drone cameras, drones um, at this current time. So had our bags checked, very cursorily checked. By the way, that's why there is no drone footage mm -hmm. because it's very expensive to get a permit and a pretty complicated. So we just decided not to mm -hmm. apply for that or do any drone footage for these videos. So I'm sorry that that's missing, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't really an option. It's extremely expensive. Yeah. Anyway, for us, we got to Shabrabesi in plenty of time and then we had the afternoon just to uh, chill out in the hotel and uh, get ready for the start of the trek the next day. On day two, we actually started trekking. So we went from Shabrabesi to Sherpagon. It was about 9.8 kilometres. 
we had uh, an elevation gain of over 1600 meters that day and it took about six and a half hours plus time for lunch and a few stops and whatnot. We left on a beautiful sunny morning, uh, we got our passports checked just before leaving the town, Govinda our guide took care of that for us uh, and then it's across the suspension bridge and then for us it was that steep climb for more than 800 meters or so to get to Kangjim through some nice forest sections. Uh, from the village of Kangjim, we continued up a little bit further to Surka, and that's where we stopped for lunch. Uh, really nice expansive views over the whole valley. Uh, you could see over towards the Tamang Heritage Trail as well. Uh, so a great spot to sit and have lunch outdoors. And we spotted a langer monkey, or rather Govinda spotted it first, mm. just hanging out in the fields below where we were having lunch. It was like, wow, that is so cool. We've barely started this trek and we've already seen a langer monkey. Yeah, I think he was <laughs> snacking on bits of crop or something like that. Um, after that, um, we continued up through the forest for a bit, some really nice forest sections, and then you come out of the forest into some more viewpoints where you can see across to the mountains where Gosenkunda is, and back down to Shabra Besi, and all over to Tulo Shabra as well, so some great views. Uh, and then the trail kind of joins a dirt road track and undulates along uh, as far as Sherpa go. As far as walking on roads go though, it really wasn't that bad. We are not fans of walking on roads, uh, but yeah, this one basically wasn't being used. There wasn't a vehicle inside. Yeah, so, it, so it was really it was really quite nice because at least you had open views and stuff of the, the hillsides opposite. And then we joined uh, a wee hiking trail down into Sherpa Gon village itself, which is um, really beautifully situated, kind of on, on a hillside, uh, I can't remember what the elevation is, I think 2550, 2000... 2, 2000... something like that. I think the sign says 2563, I'm sure you'll pop it up and see if I'm correct. Maybe. Uh, so yeah, the village itself is very nice, it's it's a mixture of like guest houses, but mostly it's like just local people's houses, so uh, it's, it's a nice village to sleep over in and we stayed at a place called uh, the New Tibet Eco Guest House. Uh, which was run by these two sisters, one of whom was very characterful, and I'm sure you might have picked up in, if you've seen the full length version of her film. So her name was Trine, and uh, she was like singing and dancing around the kitchen while making our Dal bat, making Del get up and dance with her and all this. Yeah, and we were lucky enough to be able to sit in the kitchen and yeah. watch her making the Dal bat and everything, so that was a great experience. On day three, we trekked from Sherpa Gon to Tangshap. It was about 11.4 kilometers. We had an elevation gain of over 300 meters climb that day and it took uh, again about six and a half hours plus time for lunch break and a tea stop. Yeah so leaving Sherpa gone there's quite a narrow trail it winds around the hillside a little bit of up a little bit of down it was quite nice uh, light that morning after a while you start descending you need to descend down to Rimche which is where you meet the main Langtang Valley trek route and once you get to Rimche you start meeting more people the trail was quite quiet as soon as we got there there was people at the tea house having a wee break and from there, uh, you carry on to Lama Hotel. It's not far, maybe 30 minutes walk. And you're walking through a lovely forest section, some steps, um, some dirt track. Uh, at Lama Hotel, we stopped for a cup of tea. There's quite a few guest houses there. I think, as we said before, it's not uh, a hotel, but a collection of guest houses, tea houses. And uh, we stopped to have a tea break there. We actually stopped at the guest house that we would stay at on our way back down. And in fact, Govinda booked the the room for us then. So he was getting well organised uh, even at that stage. <laughs> From Lama Hotel, uh, you're pretty much climbing uh, gradually with a few sort of steep sections here and then um, up through really, really gorgeous forest. So uh, this day as a whole was like a really nice day uh, with beautiful scenery, lovely forest sections. You're you're walking alongside the Langtang Kola. So like this kind of raging river next to you. Uh, you've got mule trains that are passing you and uh, yeah, it was a very, very, very nice day. We got to a place called Riverside Hotel uh, or Gumna Chop, which is basically just one tea house where we stopped for lunch. Um, and yeah, after that, again, just carrying on up through some forest, uh, crossing over uh, a nice suspension bridge, which is even built kind of newly since the since some landslide issues. But not a suspension bridge, this one. Oh, it was just a metal bridge. Just a metal bridge yeah. without suspension. Um, and then, oh, and then we got to like a big open section, which is full of rhododendron trees. We were a little bit too early for them to be in bloom, but uh, yeah, springtime, like April is like peak 
blooming season. There's all these rhododendron trees with colourful pinks and reds and white flowers. So it, it was very nice um, to just kind of suddenly be out in the open after spending uh, our morning in the, in the forest. And once you get to that stage, that's you pretty much out of the main forest. So go through yeah. some more sections of trees, but um, that's out of the uh, forest proper. Yeah. Go past some yak pastures. That and was then, our first time seeing yaks on this trail. Yeah, and then cross another bridge to get to go to Tabella. And actually, we had a yak on the bridge, kind of like <laughs> blocking our way. Um, at go to Tabella, there's a couple of tea houses, but there's not much. There's also a place to get your permits checked. Yeah, as the tea houses are there. quite basic there. So I think, yeah, Govinda was definitely right. It was a better um, option to carry on up to Tangshap, which um, still wasn't like super fancy or anything but it, it was just a little bit um, better service than Boda Tabella so um, and on the way up to Tangshap we got to see a couple of langur monkeys oh, yeah. uh, really close to the trail They're, they weren't phased at all by us so uh, managed to get some good shots of, of them and you saw a mountain goat yeah 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 we saw a mountain goat dashing through the forest dashing through the forest sorry um yeah so when we arrived into Tangshap, we headed for the summit guest house summit how summit guest house summit guest house yeah so govinda recommended the dalbat there and he was totally right it was the best dalbat possibly that we had in the whole of nepal this time right i mean that's a big Certainly that's, the a, best. that's a big ask considering that uh i had it like twice a day for, for me, I think that was the best style days. back, definitely in the Langtang Valley. So Summit Guest House, stop there for your lunch mm. or uh, stay overnight. So yeah, we had the, 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 the veg curry was like full of beans and stuff as well, which is not something you, you always get. Often it's just like potato based, you know. It's very tasty. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we had a private room there. The Our toilet was just outside the room, so it wasn't a private bathroom, but we didn't have to leave the building for it, which is always appreciated. Um, and yeah, good Delta. So check that place out for a tasty meal. On day four, we went from Tangshap to Langtang. It was four kilometers, an elevation gain of around 400 meters, uh, about one and a half to two hours. So obviously this was uh, a pretty straightforward and easy day, but as we've already said, uh, the whole point of uh, having such an easy day was to make sure that we were slowly ascending to the altitude at Langtang at about 3,500 metres. Um, so technically, you know, it would have been easy enough to have done more distance, but we, we were trying to play it safe with the altitude. Yeah, and so leaving uh, Tangshap in the morning, it's quite a gradual climb up and straight away, you really notice the difference in the landscape. The valley opens up um, and you have much more expansive views. You can see right up the valley, you can see as far as uh, uh, Cherigori, which is almost at 5,000 meters, is one of the day hikes you can be doing and you start to see big snowy peaks all around as well. It's quite cool looking up the valley and being mm -hmm. like, wow, we're going to be at the top of that, hopefully, in a few days time. Uh, yeah, it's very impressive being able to see it. Yeah, exactly. So it just, the trail just kind of meanders up the, up the valley, a little bit of up and down, mostly gradually up on a kind of stony, dark trail. Um, you go in and out a little bit and you come to the uh, tea house village of Goomba um, and from that point you can kind of like see down to the landslide area and in 2015 Nepal had the big earthquake and the Langtang Valley was really really badly affected at that, at that time and actually the village of Langtang itself much of it was buried beneath the landslide and um, it was a big, uh, big, big tragedy for, for the whole valley and particularly for that community but since then they've managed to rebuild a lot and, and that's actually a benefit um, when you're there trekking because a lot of the guest houses that you stay in, a lot of the services that are there have been built anew and have had thought put into them uh, for what the trekking uh, community needs. Anyway, you go down, you cross the landslide, um, there's a little bridge which takes you across a, a river and then up the other side and you're into Langtang village itself. We stayed at a place called Flavour Guest House. The owner was very nice. Um, and we had a private room with our own bathroom as well, which was a bit of a luxury again. We were like, ooh, another private bathroom. This is great. Um, but by the time we got there, I would say shortly after arriving, uh, it was like lunchtime. And uh, I was definitely feeling a little bit of like AMS symptoms. Nothing serious, but I did have a headache. I was feeling kind of that woozy feeling where uh, it's like you're on slow motion as you move your head and 
yeah, I wasn't feeling the best. I had to take some paracetamol and some ibuprofen. I just sort of rested, drank some water. After a couple of hours, I was feeling totally fine, but it was definitely a sign to me that, you know, had we continued all the way to Langtang the day before, I would have been feeling worse uh, because I was even sort of feeling it having, having gone more gradual. So I was glad that we chose to do that itinerary um, and it was good to just have the rest of the afternoon to uh, rest, to get used to that altitude. Dell did lots of washing, which was mm -hmm. uh, much appreciated. It's not very easy to do uh, laundry on the trail, um, as in like there's no laundry services or anything else, anything. Everything you have to do is just by hand, by yourself. And obviously you've got to try and dry your washing. So uh, doing it earlier in the day when there's a bit of sun around and a bit of wind uh, is a good, a good opportunity. Yeah, actually it dried super, super quick. I mean. <laughs> You were talking that some of the stuff dried in an hour. Yeah. It was uh, the heat of the sun at that altitude, plus heavy winds actually as well. So it was good to have the whole of that afternoon just to get some chores done. And also we had time to go and visit the Himalayan bakery, which I'd spied on the way in and was like, hmm, chocolate brownie. Yeah, it good. was good. I think the best bakery that we went to yeah. in the Langtown Valley. Nice owner. And uh, while we were sitting in the bakery enjoying our goodies, uh, the weather totally turned. It went from this gorgeous sunny afternoon to snow and there was like people coming up the trail uh, in the, the wind and the snow and uh, yeah, it's crazy how quickly the weather can change. Um, and then it all cleared up and it was like lovely again in the evening. <laughs> mm. But things are definitely better in the morning, the early part of the day, which is usual in the mountains. Yeah, um, as but, in clearer skies and nicer yeah, weather. Yeah, but particularly at that time of year, um, it can get quite windy and a bit more cloudy in the afternoon. Yeah, in spring. On day five, we trekked from Langtang to Kianjin Gompa. It was about six and a half kilometres. We had an elevation gain of almost 500 metres and it took about three hours. So another pretty straightforward and easy half day's walk. Yeah, it's a bit of a climb as soon as you leave uh, Langtang village and then you're ascending gradually up the valley from there past a whole long line of uh, many walls um, which is you know quite a nice thing to be walking past while you're enjoying the mountain views, going through various uh, villages. What's the name of the village? Mundu. Mundu. Yeah, so there's a lot of mani walls there. Mani walls are basically uh, almost like prayer walls, I want to say. You always walk on the left-hand side of yeah. them. Um, and yeah, it's uh, usually they're quite short, but yeah, there's a whole succession of really long ones. So that's quite an interesting uh, sort of, um, cultural aspect of day. Yeah, yeah. Mundu is a sizable village um, with uh, guest houses. There's also a medical centre there. Mm -hmm. And just past that, there was like a small coffee shop as well beside the trail. So we stopped there for um, an espresso or an Americano or whatever it was. Whatever it was, it was quite nice to have a real coffee. Yeah. When we'd been to the bakery the day before, it was like already mid afternoon, a bit late to be having coffee. Oh, that's right, opinion. yeah, hot chocolate. Beyond the coffee shop, um, it was kind of like open land, mostly going up through the valley, um, kind of rocky. Uh, then you go down by the river, don't you? And you're climbing by the, alongside the river for a while uh, before you kind of come up towards Kianjin Gomba. So yeah, it, at this part of the trail, uh, there are a whole load of um, uh, like prayer wheels in the river. So uh, the river flowing through it makes them turn and stupas and things like that. And basically you need to stick to the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. So from here on the way into Kianjin Gompa, you go up one side of the valley. And when you're returning to Shabru Besi, when you're heading back down, you actually go on a different side. So uh, the, the trails do diverge a little bit here. So. Uh, it's a very picturesque spot with you know all these prayer wheels. Further up, you've got this massive white stupa. There were a couple of yaks there, and I was like, "Ooh, yaks!" They were just chilling, and I was like taking some video on my phone and stuff. And um, yeah, one of them took Cambridge and uh, actually started coming for me. And Govinda was shouting, "Kim, Kim!" And I was like, "Ah!" So uh, forevermore, I'll be referring to that as the accident and I had to run away and this yak was like chasing me for a bit. So that was a bit scary. So Do not get, get that too close, close to, the yaks. to yaks. Yeah. Don't be a numpty like me and do that. So yeah, keep your distance from the yaks. Uh, after that, there was the hydroelectric um, power station. Station, yeah. Yeah, so there's a reservoir. I mean, hydroelectric, hydroelectric power station conjures certain images into your head. <laughs> 
it's a small, yeah. you know, one room building. Yeah, um, a wee one. So there's a, a reservoir up the top and there's like pipes coming down the hillside and that's what provides the electricity for Kianjin Gompa and for Langtang. Um, so uh, it might be a bit of an eyesore, but we're very thankful for it and it's providing services. I don't think it region. looks too bad. Um, and then there's a big suspension bridge mm -hmm. and uh, about halfway across the suspension bridge, when you look up to the left, you can see, uh, I think it was called Kim Kimshun Glacier, and you're like, whoa, that's cool. There's and a massive all the glacier. Bond as well. All that too, but you're like, there's a glacier, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then you don't really get a view of Kanjin Gompa till like right at the last minute when you're just like, it's all there in front of you, all these colourful buildings, uh, and that, that was pretty cool. Uh, Govinda took us to a guest house called Holy Land's Guest House. And that turned out to be like our favourite guest house of not only the Langtang Valley trek, but I'd say pretty much our entire month trekking in Nepal this time round. Uh, very friendly owners, Lopsang and I can never get his name right, Gyalbu? Is that Gyalbu. Right? Gyalbu. Who, who is yeah. also a Yala Peak climbing guide. Uh, guide. Yeah. So if you're wanting to go to Yala Peak, he's your man. Uh, he'll yeah. sort you out. So yeah, it was a really nice guest house, excellent food, friendly owners, a good dining room um, and because lots of people spend at least two nights in Kanjin Gompa, it kind of feels like you get to know people a little bit more because you're maybe uh, getting to spend two or three days with them, uh, having chats in the dining room and stuff. We had a great room with a private bathroom and a sit down toilet, hot shower. It was excellent. So I was very happy there. Although the first morning that we were there, the pipes were frozen. Uh, which is not uncommon, yeah. especially at that time of year, because temperatures can get really low in the middle of the night, down to maybe minus 10 to minus 20. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, even though we had a flushing toilet, there was a bucket of water next to it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's how you flush. Um, so yeah, the rest of the day, I think we got there for, for lunch, had some lunch, and then there is a yak cheese factory, which you can go and visit. They weren't making yak cheese Factories, at the time. The factory again is a strong term. They weren't making cheese at the time, but uh, we got to go and taste some yak cheese, which up until that point I hadn't had, and I have been missing out. It is delicious. It sort of reminded me of Manchego, which is like my favourite cheese ever. Uh, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't quite like that, but yeah, it's not a super strong uh, flavour. It's quite subtle, but just very tasty. And uh, I was like having yak cheese on everything after that. Delicious. And then we went up to the monastery. Uh, lots of prayer flags up there, big stupas. The monastery itself is only open sort of in the mornings, I think. So we, we didn't get to see inside inside. We just saw inside, if that makes sense. Inside the kind of... Yeah, with the paintings What would you stuff. call it? The vestibule. vestibule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we just headed back to the guest house for the evening. Uh, again, it was like just chilling, chatting with people and... Um, yeah, it was it was really nice to know that we were just going to be based there for the next uh, three nights uh, and our little our little home in the mountains for the next few days. On day six, we did the first of our two day hikes. So we went from Kianjin Gompa up to Kianjin Ri. Uh, Ri means viewpoint, and then back down to Kianjin Gompa again. It was about four and a half kilometers with a sort of seven hundred and thirty meter climb, and it took us about four and a half hours plus lots of time just hanging out and enjoying the views. So we decided to do this one first, uh, just because it's uh, the lower viewpoint of the two between this and Chirguri. Uh, the high point on this one is about 4,600 metres. Uh, most people that do this um, uh, as a, a morning hike, you start pretty early in the morning so you can get up and get the uh, best views you can as early as possible. So when you leave first thing in the morning, it's very, very cold and the valley is in shadow. It's a steep climb straight away, but that's quite good because it gets the heart rate going and it gets the body temperature up, so um, uh, that helps you deal with the cold. But uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it's quite a steep climb, so um, that can be tough. Yeah. You you basically climb to uh, an initial viewpoint at about 4,300 metres. So some people just go to this lower viewpoint. It's about an hour and a half, I would say, from Kanjin Gompa, just climbing steeply on switchbacks the whole way up. Uh, to get to all these prayer flags at this kind of rocky outcrop at about 4,300 metres. With amazing views, you can see the, the reservoir, which is what feeds the, the hydro um, power station, as I called it earlier, uh, box. And uh, it's a beautiful colour. It's like this gorgeous greeny blue uh, lake uh, reservoir with all of the mountains around and it's, it's absolutely spectacular. So we got there and just sort of hung out for about an hour. Govinda pulled out 
a surprise thermos of masala tea. I was like, are you kidding? You've been carrying that up here? Uh, so that was delicious because they made lots the of, best yeah. masala tea at that guest house. And uh, lots of photos, lots of video. I mean, most people would not spend an hour at that viewpoint, but we did. And Why the not? The time passed uh, quite quickly. Just enjoying your tea and your views. But uh, as Kim said, great views all around. Really, every direction you look in, yeah. there's like snowy mountains. Yeah. So um, it's, it's if you're into your photography, it's uh, hard not to spend time there. What if you just like looking at nice views with your that eyeballs, too. taking that photos too. with your eyeballs? That too. Uh, so from the lower viewpoint at 4,300 metres, we continued up to the higher viewpoint. So it's another like 300 metres climb, about another hour and a half to get up there. You can easily see the trail. It's uh, going up this ridge, uh, pretty steep at some points, but not too challenging. What are you saying, Magi Pie? Sorry, we're cat sitting at the moment and uh, the cats had been chilling out and sleeping but this is their time to wander and, around yeah, make noise making a little whinge um so yeah we continued up to the the higher viewpoint and we saw this massive avalanche on the way uh, we were like chatting to some other people on the way up and then i could just hear the sound i was like guys avalanche it was it was quite impressive to see and powerful yeah scary to see actually uh but i mean it was nowhere near us so we were totally safe we got up to the, the prayer flags up at uh, the higher viewpoint and yeah we had a wee packed lunch with us. We had some chapati with omelette and uh, some more masala tea left over so that was our little packed lunch. Uh, and just again probably chilled out for another hour or something just enjoying the views. Yeah. It was incredible we could see I think four different glaciers just all of these big big mountains and it was kind of it was kind of crazy to think that we'd just been down at this lower altitude in the forest just a couple of days before and suddenly we were surrounded by like these big big mountains it was it was very impressive we got our oxygen levels checked as well yeah. that that became like a almost like a game between the three of us us two and govinda and that continued into the everest three passes trek as well <laughs> where we were like checking who had the most oxygen in their in their blood supply I, I felt like I was kind of cheating because I was taking Diabox, which is uh, something you can take to, to help you acclimatise quicker. And, and it kind of, uh, I think that was making my blood oxygen saturation levels higher than they would have been if I wasn't taking Diabox. Yeah. It was interesting. The last time we trekked in Nepal was 2018, and we only came across one person who had one of these oximeters, which uh, measures the level of oxygen in your blood. And that was a nurse from New Zealand, and she had one with her. Uh, but these days, it seems like all the guides, all the trekking yeah. companies, they just carry one as standard so that um, they can always, at the end of it, every day or whatever they are, they can check the oxygen level of the, their trekkers. It's a, good, it's a good thing to have. Yeah, so we did a little, little test up there uh, and Del had the lowest oxygen score as usual, but also I'd say he's probably the fittest of all of us, uh, all the exercise you do and stuff. So yeah, it didn't um, matter. It's, some people just generally have a bit lower than others so it's not always uh, a problem if you, you know. yeah it's nothing to do with how fit you are or not it's yeah each individual can react completely differently to altitude so that's quite interesting to see. Mm -hmm. anyway so from there that's pretty much the high point of the the day hike you can just go back down the same way but it's also possible to make like a circuit back to Kianjin Gompa, uh, going down the neighbouring valley and that's what we decided to do. It was also a bit more sheltered and well it's always nice to just make a circuit instead of just retrace your steps isn't it. So uh, yeah we rejoined the route further down, headed back into Kianjin Gompa for a nice hot shower which was delightful and, uh, and then went for a wee treat at the bakery in town. Actually there's quite a few bakeries in town, we just went to the one that um, Maxing at uh, the Himalayan Bakery in Langtang had recommended. His brother had a bakery in uh, Kandrin Gompa. So we went there. It was quite busy. There was kind of lots of people in there having chit chats and that. Uh, so we, yeah, we hung out in there and then got cozied up after dinner uh, in our room, which was freezing, but thankfully we had our sleeping bags and a nice warm blanket so they give you. And, all of our down jackets. But it actually it wasn't as cold that night as the previous night. The Why pipes the pipes weren't frozen yeah. uh, <laughs> the next morning. So. I was like, Dal, make sure you do not flush that toilet in the morning because you've always got like one flush, you know, that's already in the cistern. I was like, no flushing off that toilet unless it's absolutely necessary. But actually, we didn't need the bucket of water that morning. Mm -hmm. We had frozen. Anyway, enough toilet chat. On to the next day. <laughs> Magic pie. 
Oh, did you understand that? That's it. So, day seven. This is Madge. Her brother is called Harold. Any neighbours fans are going to get that. Uh, so, day seven, we went from Kanjin Gompa to Chirguri and back down to Kanjin Gompa. It was about nine kilometres. We had an elevation gain of over 1,100 metres and it took about eight hours. So, it was a full on day hike and I would say pretty much the highlight of our entire Langtang Valley trek. It was fantastic. As with the trek going up to um, the day hike going up to Kanjin Ri, it's good to start as early as possible. And take a packed lunch. And take a packed lunch. Um, the clouds can come in quite quickly as the day goes on. So the sooner you get up to the top, the more chance you have of those expansive mountain views. And you certainly do get those. So you can head northeast out of Kianjin Gompa um, through the valley area and then you cross a little stream. And then before long, you're heading uphill. Yeah, so the first bit, the climb isn't too bad. You're just kind of going around the hillside. And then on that ridge bit, you get to these stone shelters, which are, are used in the summer months by yak herders who are like grazing the yaks up there and bring them in to, to milk them and to make the cheese. And then after that, it was a pretty steep climb on switchbacks uh, up like a steep um, stony, steep uh, stone, ridge, yeah. a dirt trail with quite loose stones, which is actually quite difficult on the way back down. Yeah. A little bit tricky. Anyway. Yeah. And then we got to a more kind of flat section up the top of that, which is where we saw our first snow. Uh, there's like a kind of open grazing area, the remnants of some more like stone shelters, um, some yaks up there. We stopped to have another cup of masala tea. So there's again, like a stone seating area. Yeah, again, Govinda had packed a thermos of masala tea. I was like, mm, you're the man. And uh, we saw a few other people coming up behind mm -hmm. us there. Um, and yeah, we were kind of on the trail with a few other people from that point onwards. And uh, from here, the trail got a lot more kind of rocky. There was a lot more like kind of boulders and big rocks strewn around uh, the hillsides, some steep sections. We were getting quite high in altitude there and you could definitely, you could definitely feel that it was getting tougher. There were some other people that were really struggling on the trail actually and, and they turned around um, and went back down, which I think was probably the right decision. One guy who was who was hiking up with a massive bag on, I don't know what he was playing at. It looked <laughs> Maybe like he didn't he was, have much in it. Uh, it looked like he was carrying all of, all of his gear. Yeah, so obviously the good thing about these day hikes is you can just leave all the stuff you don't need back at your guest house and you, you only need to take, you know, whatever you need for that day, water and your layers and your food and stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, so we... Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Oh, but it's not coming right now, so that's like a super awkward pause. Carry on. Oh yeah, so there's <laughs> there's a kind of jumbled boulder section and then another kind of uh, steep climb and then by that stage we got to the point where it was like permanent snow. Well not permanent snow, but on that day it was total snow and that's when we put our micro spikes on um, because it was getting a little bit slippy. And those... So the only reason we had micro spikes with us was because we knew we would be crossing Chola Pass on the Everest Three Passage route. And it's like a, an icy glacier that you have to cross. That's the only reason we had micro spikes. But we thought, well, we might as well carry them with us just in case. And I'm so glad that we did have them. I wasn't really expecting to be walking in snow mm -hmm. on this uh, on this route. But, I mean, yeah, snow had come in March and in April in, uh, the, in the Himalayas this year in, in Nepal. Uh, kind of unexpectedly. So I was I was very thankful that we had them. And in the video, you might have seen me like not very gracefully putting on my micro spikes that was the first time i'd ever worn them so they were not very stretchy yet yeah, hence had, why i was incapable of doing it i had tried them on before no? oh only once but yeah they were uh, anyway from that point where we put them on to get to the the summit it was actually quite steep in parts and the snow had become quite icy and it was quite hard packed and so it it's was, easy to slip yeah it was so cold as well the wind had really picked up and the wind chill was just unbelievable i had a uh, big thick gloves on but my hands had already gotten kind of uh, chilled before i even put them on and then they just felt so numb that it was as if they were burning uh you don't suffer with your hands quite as much as i, I actually do. do suffer like i i only had one glove on and i was like standing there waiting for a good 20 minutes while you sorted out your cold hand situation well, I was getting the various pain. shots um, and then the next day my hands were all numb and then they cracked open and stuff so yeah, so it was very, very cold. So make sure you've got all your layers with you and um, yeah, take micro spikes, I would say, just in case there is snow up on, on Chirgory because you never know, even if 
it's a time of year where you wouldn't expect it, you don't know what could happen. So um, that final climb up to the top was bitterly cold. Uh, there was lots of people that didn't have micro spikes and were literally sliding on their bums down the trail, not having a very good time. There was one woman that ended up just uh, getting piggybacked with who I assume was her guide uh, back off the mountain and he was like running with her down the trail and prior to that she had literally been moving at snail's pace which is exactly what I would be like if I didn't have those micro spikes um, and then we got to the top and suddenly it was all sheltered there was like no wind it was amazingly warm compared to what we'd just been through and uh, yeah we could celebrate we were at just under 5,000 meters uh, which was a pretty good feeling at that stage, the clouds were coming in quite rapidly, so we still had some views, but not as much as you might otherwise get. Um, and Dell was like pretty raging because it was one of those scenarios where the other people up there, when they saw him with his tripod and things, it's like, oh, he must be like professional or something. And then everybody suddenly started asking him to take their photos and all this, and it's like, you know how it goes. It's never just one picture. It's like, oh, can we get this angle? Can we get that angle? And I could see he was just like in his head, he's thinking, I need to get the shots. The clouds are coming in. I want to film stuff. And everyone was like asking him to take their photo. And um, yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't uh, I told, them, about I told them you could do it. Yeah. And then you can see the, the look of disappointment on their faces. They're like, oh, but she doesn't have the professional camera. She won't be as good as taking a photo. I was like, I can take a photo perfectly well. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, so we kind of um, we kind of didn't really Wait get I? time. We didn't really get time to enjoy the views as much for ourselves because everyone else started asking us to take their pictures um, and had to calm Dell down with a bit of lunch to to stop his hunger. Uh, and then after that, the views pretty much went away, didn't they? Completely went away. Completely went away. By the time we started descending, it was like you couldn't see a single thing, and the snow had started coming in. Visibility was maybe yeah. thirty meters max. Or something. Yeah. So uh, we just returned the same way. I think there is maybe another way that you can go back, but it takes much longer. And yeah, it's it was just safer in that moment to just go back the exact same way uh, that we just come up. So yeah, it was just a case of heading on down. No more stopping apart from a few shots and uh, we saw some Tibetan snowcocks back where we'd had some masala tea on the way up and uh, if I don't know if you know what Tibetan snowcocks are but they're basically these birds that like sort of high altitude areas they're quite they're quite kind of like elusive they like to just be in quiet places are you gonna make the sound um, or are you gonna just pop I don't, that, pop I don't that know if I can somehow. do it. I don't know if I've got a recording of sound, but the, the sound that they make is amazing. We do, we do. It's we do. like they're laughing at each other or like chuckling away. And so constantly I would be like, oh, I can hear snowcocks, I can hear snowcocks, where are they? Where are they? And uh, so we saw some there for the first time since we'd been trekking in 2018, and I was really excited and I was like, Del, can you get the snowcocks? Can you get the snowcocks? And I can't repeat it here because it was quite rude and my mother watches this. But he was like, beep, the snowcocks. And me and Govinda just were like ending ourselves laughing. Um, but yeah, so there was no snowcock footage from there. And that became a running joke for the rest of Nepal. Like, Del, can you find some snowcocks? Beep, the snowcocks. This was on the back of two consecutive shots where <laughs> I'd had to uh, descend a snowy hillside, ascend the other side, set up the tripod and the camera, go all the way back, walk, go and do it again, and go all the way back. So, the mech, so like, and this was at the end of a long day as well, not even at the end of a long day. So the idea of then going hunting for the snowcocks to try and get a shot of them, which I probably wouldn't get, I wasn't, I wasn't exactly enthusiastic, enthusiastic about, about it. That, yeah. Anyway, from that point on, we were below the snow level, the clouds kind of lifted, and you had a bit more views down into the valley again, and then it was just back down the way we came. Yeah. So I think we would all agree, me, you and Govinda, that that day was the highlight of the whole of the Langtang Valley trek, right? Um, yeah, I also really enjoyed Kyanjin Ri. Okay, yeah, but so... the, the day hikes and getting up high and getting all those views was amazing. They were, they were some of the big highlights for sure. Yeah. yeah, so I guess what we're getting at is if you're going to do the Langtang Valley trek, I wouldn't necessarily consider these day hikes as like add-ons. I would definitely just consider these as like part of the trek and things that you want to do. So another reason for 
making your itinerary uh, a sensible one in terms of the altitude gain every day uh, to make sure that you are in a position once you get to Kianjin Gompa to be doing these day hikes and not you know feeling rubbish because you've ascended to Kianjin Gompa too quickly. I hope that made sense. Yeah, I mean, for if for example you've gone from Lamo Hotel at two thousand five hundred to uh, Lantang at three thousand five hundred, then the next day to Kianjin Gompa, then the next day say up to Chergori at five thousand, that's like. Uh, that's a lot of meters to go up in yeah. a very very short space of time. There's a very good, you're asking for trouble, really. Yeah, so. there's a very good chance that you're not going to be feeling good going up to Chergori, even if you've been feeling fine at Kianjin Gompa. So, and you know you're not going to make it up there. You're going to want to turn around and head back down, and you're going to miss out on that. So, uh, yeah, it's an argument for just taking it slow as you ascend up to Kianjin Gompa to make sure that you really are in the best position possible to get the views and to get this experience on these day hikes. So. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing the Langtang Valley Trek because you don't have a huge amount of time and you think it's kind of a short one to do, then that's a decision that you have to make about the pace that you take it at. Mm. But if you have enough time, then we fully recommend taking your time through the trek and staging it properly mm -hmm. so that the chances of having any symptoms of altitude sickness are really, really minimized. Yeah, obviously, if you're already acclimatized, like if you've already been trekking within the previous week at high altitude somewhere else then in no Nepal, problem. then it's no problem. You could you could definitely uh, ascend a bit faster because your body will already be used to that altitude. But if it's your first one and you're not acclimatized, then yeah, do what you can to try and make sure you do get to include these amazing day hikes because they were absolutely fantastic and a highlight for us, we loved them. On day eight, we went from Kanjin Gompa all the way back down the valley to Lama Hotel. It was about 18 kilometers. We had sort of an elevation gain of about 450 meters, but we were mostly dropping down about over 1800 meters descent. And it took about five and a half hours plus time for a lunch stop and a chicken bee coffee stop as well. Yeah, the thing to remember here when you leave Kanjin Gompa is to take the left route and not take the one to the right, which goes over the suspension bridge, basically the way you came in. So then that rejoins the trail after you've gone past all the stupas. And then, yeah, you're just retracing your steps. It's pretty easy. Uh, it's mostly downhill, um, so you can make some good time. And yeah, that's it. You've already been on the route, so you'll probably already know where you want to stop for your lunch, mm -hmm. where you want to stop for your coffee. We wanted to get coffee at the Himalayan Bakery in Langtang, and then down to Tangshat for the best alba ever, again, for our lunch. Uh, it was a nice morning. Which is what we did. Oh, I totally forgot. When we left um, Holy Lamb Guest House, we've been staying there for three nights. When we left, uh, Lopsang, the, the owner, she brought down the flag, the, the scarves for us. Mm -hmm. They're like, good luck scarves. So, and she presented us all with the scarves to wish us good luck on our journey, which was very nice, which we didn't actually capture on the main camera because we didn't happen to be filming at the time. Uh, I think I got a clip on my phone though. So uh, yeah, that was a really nice moment. So if you saw us wearing these blue scarves and you're like, what are they all about? Uh, that was why they'd been presented to us. So wish for, you good luck good on the luck. journey. Yeah, so yeah, that's quite nice. So we got to Tang Shap, had our delicious talbat, and uh, after that the weather closed in and it pretty much just was torrential rain for the rest of the afternoon. So we had all the waterproofs on, couldn't really film all, all that much because uh, obviously we didn't want to have the camera out, plus we'd already been on the trail and uh, seen it all anyway. Did go through a lovely little bit of rhododendron forest, which was beautiful. And yeah, we made it down to Lama Hotel. We had all the waterproofs on. Govinda had his umbrella. Oh, yeah, that made yeah. us laugh. It was like all of our you know, jackets and waterproof trousers and all the gear. And it's just like, why would you do that when you could just carry an umbrella? I mean, I know why I couldn't do that, because I need to have two hands. And uh, luckily yeah. enough as well, the rain was coming straight down. You know, it was pretty torrential, but there was yeah. no, next to no wind. So. Yeah, maybe that's it. Like if you're hiking in Scotland, the rain is basically coming sideways and an umbrella wouldn't do you much good. No good whatsoever. And the wind would be blowing it inside out. But uh, yeah. yeah, that was quite funny. Uh, and his shoes were like totally dry. And even though we've got, you know, Gore-Tex hiking boots and all this, it was like no chance if you're just walking through torrential rain for hours on end. So anyway, we got to Lama Hotel. And Lama Hotel is the most like basic uh, group of accommodation, I would say, on the trail. It's in, it's like tucked into a narrow valley. It's quite a scenic setting actually, but all of the buildings are quite old. From what I could understand from what Kavinda was saying is they're not, uh, the hotel 
owners are not allowed to renovate them at all. It's something to do with... The land the, is owned by the government. Yeah, or, or like the national park rules yeah. or, or something. So they're not actually allowed to really make any renovations and uh, improve the structures. So they're all quite old. They're quite attractive to look at, but they are quite basic. Um, and No chance of an attached bathroom. No chance of it. Not even a bathroom that is like in the same building where you're sleeping. Uh, we had to like dart across the rainy courtyard to get to like a squat toilet out the back and yeah basically if it was going to be torrential rain this was like the worst place that we could have been staying because the facilities were outside um but you know it's one night you just get on with it it'll yeah happy. and the, it's cozy enough the, the owner was friendly yeah. the food was decent and yeah. there was plenty of people there and it was a good atmosphere yeah it was very busy and it was uh, one of the few places where there was like no wi-fi no phone service in fact there wasn't even enough solar uh power to be able to charge a device like literally you just had a light in your room and that was all um so yeah i guess it was kind of like a an old school trekking atmosphere because everyone is forced to like chat and play games because there's no other option you can't just be sitting on your phone or whatever and another thing about this sort of standard itinerary is that you stay at lama hotel on the way up and you stay at lama hotel on the way down and i don't really get that because like i say it's one of the most basic uh, places to stay on the route. The services are not that great in terms of like, you know, toilets and showers and things like that. So if I were you, I would I would not be staying there two times on the trip. I would be mixing it up a bit. And I think the one change that we would have made to our itinerary is that we would have just kept going another like 25 minutes to Rimchi, yeah. um, which uh, is, is still kind of basic. There's only two tea houses there. You know, the toilets are squat toilets outside of the rooms that you have to walk outside in the open to get to. But the views are really nice from there. It's a bit more open. The views are nice. And uh, was it the Hotel Ganesh view? I, I think, think so. The, the people that work there are really nice. The owner. Yeah, the owner there was really nice, really friendly. We spoke to him and uh, on our way down, they actually let us come in and have a look at the, the dining room and everything just so we could get a sense of the place, even yeah. though we weren't staying there. And um, yeah, yeah they, they were really nice and the views from the dining room were excellent. And yeah. Yeah, we got a really good feeling about that place and wished that we had stayed there. Yeah, we just carried on the 30 minutes, but I mean, either way, it was atmospheric to stay in Lama Hotel anyway. Uh, so yeah, we, we hung up our stuff to try and dry it. Um, and I believe there were spiders in the bed that night for me. I wasn't, I wasn't too impressed by that. I think I had to clear out mm. two or three spiders mm. for you or something. Mm. Yeah. On day nine, which was our, the final trekking day, we went from Lama Hotel to, well, not Shayabri Bessie, but that's what you would do if this was going to be your final trekking day. Uh, it's about 10.6 kilometres, uh, a little bit of up and down, 500 odd metres elevation gain and uh, nearly 600 metres uh, elevation loss. So mostly descending and it would take about five and a half hours plus time for your lunch and whatever other stops. Yeah, so if you leave, if you've been staying at Lama Hotel, you leave there, it's about 25 to 30 minutes uh, through the forest to get to Rimchi, where you get the views out over the valley. Um, if you were interested at this point in going via Sherpagon, if you hadn't gone that way on the way up, then this is the point where you can leave, taking the trail to the right, climbing up towards Sherpagon. Uh, otherwise... And that's also the way you'd go if you wanted to join uh, onto the Tamang Heritage sure. Trail. Yeah. Uh, leaving Rimche, it's quite a steep descent. Um, you kind of go through the forest where we saw a ton of langur monkeys. That was yeah, really quite was exciting. Um, and then there's quite a lot of like stone steps going down through the forest. You come out into a bit of an open hillside where there's a kind of landslide area where you have to be quite careful. No, it's not a hillside. You're down at the river. You descend all the way the to the Langtan Kola and yeah, there's a landslide area with huge like boulders and so on. and. It's yeah. on a hillside just above the river um, and there's a narrow trail so you need to be careful and not hang around there like us going backwards and forwards picking up the tripod and the camera. Um, soon you cross over a suspension bridge uh, and then you're on the other side of the river and then that's where really is some of the most beautiful forest yeah. on the entire trail. I would say actually the most beautiful forest on the it entire trail. It was absolutely gorgeous. We were loving it. It was like one of those days where we were like, oh, like, let's try not film too much. You know, we're getting towards the, the end of this trek and we don't want it, this film to be dragging on and whatnot. But it was like, every time we turned a corner, it was like, oh, this is it's, it's, so beautiful. We need to take another shot. It's one of those days where the word sun dappled is used <laughs> a little bit too much by many, many people. What are you trying further, Dylan? I'm not just saying you. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it was without doubt, I would say, the most beautiful section of forest um, as far as bamboo. And then also after bamboo, yeah. there was some really, really nice sections. Bamboo is a, a tea house settlement, by the way. It's not talking about actual bamboo. But there is, there actual, is bamboo. actual bamboo. There is actual, yeah. actually lots of bamboo, which is yeah. probably where it gets its name. No doubt. Bamboo is a tea house settlement where lots of people have their lunch. On um, the way up. On yeah. the way up and maybe also on the way down. Um, but we continued on to the next settlement called Pyro, which I think was just like two little tea houses um, and had our lunch there. And there's also a hot spring nearby there. So if you fancy a dip in a hot spring, a natural hot spring outdoors, uh, pack your swimmers. Uh, we didn't. We were kind of just uh, had a, a goal of where we wanted to get to there and weren't too fast for the swim uh, or the dip. But uh, yeah, it's uh, on this section, there's no more local villages. It's just like sort of tea house settlements. And so guest houses that have, have sprung up purely to serve trekkers, uh, their lunch and overnight stays and whatever. So beautiful forest section. Sorry. For I was just going to say, I seem to remember there was a quote from David Attenborough on the board for the hot springs. I think that was made up. Was it made up? I don't know. Yeah. It seemed, seemed like it was made up. What was the quote? Enlighten us. Uh, that he's had legs of a 20 year old when he got out of the hot springs. <laughs> and um, I don't know when it did was... He, did he I don't say know, this I don't, when he was 20? I don't know when he... Was this like 70 years ago? I doubt it was when he was 20. No one was trekking in Nepal then. Um, I'm sure some people were. Not very many people. I mean, David Adler might have been, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so um, after Pyro, we uh, actually turned off the Langtang Valley Trek and we started on our Gossenkunda Trek. So we headed off uphill to the left. Um, and if you were not doing that and you were just finishing your trek this day, we've done the, not done the next section of trail, but by all accounts, it's just a pretty straightforward, uh, not quite as interesting or beautiful section back down, following the river down to Shapu Um But yeah, we headed off on the Gossenkunda trek. So if you have about another week or so, let's say, and you wanted to join the two treks together, it's a fantastic option. Um, it, Gossenkunda is a lake, a high alpine lake at about 4,400 meters. It's a pilgrimage site uh, for Hindus and yeah, spectacular. So if you want to see more from that, um, Keep an eye on this channel we will be uh releasing some films and uh, a guide for that and written guides over on the blog as well so yeah we also uh, got tuned. a lot of snow when we were up there which yeah. made it pretty special yeah it was amazing um so yeah that's that's the the last bit of the trek and uh you would just get back to shabra Bessi overnight in a guest house there and then you can take public transport or a private jeep out the next morning to head back to Kathmandu. Thank you very much for watching. We hope you find this guide helpful and for even more information about the Langtang Valley Trek, do head over to our website goingthewholehog.com. We've got a whole section on Nepal with uh, various guides, uh, itineraries and so on for a number of treks in Nepal, including this one. And if you haven't seen our videos yet from the Langtang Valley Trek, you can find them on our channel. Like we said, there's a short version and a full length version and it's uh, a bit more of a visual guide rather than a talking guide like this. A big thank you to Sandy at Himalayan Masters for inviting us out to Nepal to do these treks. It was a really, really fantastic experience and we do appreciate it. Um, big thank you also to Govinda for um, being such an excellent guide. Really looked after us so well on the trail and um, the best guide we've ever had for sure. And finally, a big thank you to all our patrons for your continued support. And if you watching would also like to support our continued filmmaking and guide writing. The information for our Patreon community is in the description. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to our channel if you've enjoyed this. Hit that like button, drop us a comment down below. It uh, really does help us to grow this channel and to reach more people. It's a small thing that you can do and it has a big impact for us. So we appreciate it if you can take two seconds to do that. We know some of you might be watching on TV and it's not so easy to do it. So just whenever you're next on your phone, be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go and give, give that video a little thumbs up and we appreciate it. Until next time, cheerio. Cheerio, thanks for watching, bye. Harold and Madge say bye bye to you. Bye bye. Madge, are you leaving us a comment? Yeah. What's that? Oh, I think he said he loves going the whole hog and he's subscribed. <laughs> Is that it, Madge? Have you subscribed? Have you? Ding! You're going to hit that notification bell? Ding! Yeah. These aren't our cats, by the way. We're just cat sitting. Yeah, okay. <laughs>
she's loving it. She's it just looks confused.